Australia. It's a small uh, country in population, but a very, very large country in size, as many of you would know. There are about 120,000 Jews. We have the second highest per capita Holocaust survivor community in the world. And I'll come back to why that is so important. The main Jewish centres are Melbourne and Sydney. The, uh, the community uh, has, as I assume, many in the world. And uh, now a large influx of Israelis, we think something between 10 and 15,000. And probably a similar number, if not more, Russian Jews who have arrived in the last uh, 15 or 20 years. We're, even though we're considered a relatively conservative community, there is a broad spectrum of uh, religious practice from uh, orthodox, modern orthodox, ultra-orthodox, um, conservative, progressive reform, and of course non-religious streams. We are known as a community with a very, very organized sense of ourselves. We have a large number of organizations. We tend to function through our organizations. In terms of Jewish continuity, and this is, this is where you'll see the trends. At the moment, in total, uh, approximately 26.5% of our couples have one Jewish partner and one non-Jewish partner. Of the older age group, 55 to 64, I guess uh, typically, about 15% only have a non-Jewish partner. But in the 25 to 34-year-old age group, somewhere between 40 and 45% have one non-Jewish partner. So there you see one of our challenges. Jewish education, which we're famous for, our community. We have 15 Jewish day schools, which for a community of our size is a lot. And it spans the whole spectrum of a, a religious practice. Almost between 65 and 70% of our youngsters are in Jewish day schools. 65 to 70%. Most of those schools take out the Haredi and the um, and there is actually a Bun Skiff school, believe it or not. In, they have a little bit of Zionism, but not a lot. But nearly all of the other schools place Israel and Zionist education as a very high priority of their curriculum, both formal and informal. We also have for kids in non-Jewish day schools, which are now increasing, um, uh, informal Jewish education during school and after school. The key challenge for the, our participation in Jewish day schools is today it costs between twenty and $27,000 a year to send a child to a Jewish day school. And my sense is that in most parts of the world that's not unusual. On Israel, and this where me and myself as the President of the Zionist Federation of Australia, I'm so proud of these statistics. Just remember, we're about 27 hours away from here. Okay, for those of you who haven't flown one direction, let alone two. 86.5% of Jewish adults have visited Israel at least once. 64% have visited twice or more. And there are people in this room who have visited about 120 times. 80% of our community on, on the, under the Geno 8 definition, which I'll explain in a minute, 80% identify themselves as Zionists. Now, the definition used for the Geno 8 survey was... Do you regard yourself as a Zionist? By that term, we mean that you feel connected to the Jewish people, to Jewish history, culture and beliefs, the Hebrew language, and the Jewish homeland. I know it's a fairly minimalist definition, but on that definition, 80% of the people surveyed said, yes, we're Zionists. We send about 730 youngsters a year on Israel programs, short and long. And that's after school age, uh, college uh, and older and about 250 on Year 10 school programs. We have six Zionist youth movements. Some people think that's very old-fashioned. We're very proud of them. We have, almost, we have about 49 to 50 shlichim, emissaries, many from the Jewish agency, which Alan is involved in with, of course, for youth movements, communities, schools, and all sorts of other institutions. And as I said before, we have a very, very high number of organizations which affiliate with the Zionist movement. So you can see from these statistics, I think compared to many other parts of the world, we're doing relatively well from a Jewish and Zionist perspective. But the challenges are growing. Now, what are the positive factors that contributed to this success, given what the professor said, to see 
how this compares, what are the drivers to this, uh, our community success up till now, and then I want to talk a little bit about the challenges, and you'll see that to some extent they're the flip side of the positives. As I said, we're a Holocaust survivor community, so this produced a number of great communal leaders for which Jewish education and the connection to Israel was very important when they arrived uh, from their completely destroyed lives after the Shoah. Very high Jewish day school participation. We have active Zionist youth movements, which exert influence well beyond their numbers and produce a lot of our best communal leaders. There's a very broad-based commitment to make Israel a key part of our community. And that's, as I said before, why we have Sofnut uh, and WZO Shlichim. Many educational resources we, we use from Israel in our schools. We have lots of Israeli speakers coming and many, many a large amount of resources committed to sending our young people to Israel on school trips, Taglit Birthright and Massah. There's a very close relationship, and I think this is unusual within the Jewish world, between the philanthropists and the communal leaders. They're not in different spheres. We talk to each other a lot. They support us a lot with our activities. So these, I think, are the five key drivers that have met, met, made this community the success that it is. But what are the challenges for tomorrow? And I believe they're common to most communities and most of you sitting here. This larger intermarriage rate in our younger generation, which is obviously growing and a very, very serious concern. The Holocaust survivors that created the community, of course, are starting to die out. Many, many have. The cost of Jewish education. Most of our younger people, even with good jobs, this is after tax dollars, cannot afford $27,000 per child each year. And I don't think that's going to go down. And there are people in the room here who have been working very hard on trying to create models for philanthropists to support reduction of fees, but to date we haven't found the magic solution. The children of philanthropists are less interested in Israel and Jewish causes than their parents. That's a common factor. The corrosive effects of anti-Israel campaigns in the media, and to a lesser extent, thank God, so far on the campuses, are also having some impact. Our youngsters don't necessarily want to connect to things they see as toxic <coughs> and difficult. The challenge for Israeli fundraisers, who traditionally were selling Israel as the poor cousin that needed support, how do they reconcile that with the fact that we're also extolling the virtues of the economic miracle that Israel is today? That contradictory message is difficult for many of our fundraisers to deal with. And I want to say here, because this was a big topic last year when Peter Barnard came to the President's Conference, there is an issue among some of our youngsters, but I'm talking about the committed ones, about some Israeli government policies being a turn-off, perhaps, to their connection to Israel. But I think it's overrated, I think it's exaggerated, I don't think it's a key factor in our younger people disengaging. I think what's the problem with disengagement has much to do with their dis disassociation and, and weakening connection with the Jewish community and people. That's the fact, and not the fact that some don't happen to agree with the policies of this particular Israeli government or any other. Now, our communal leadership with the Zionist movement, of which I'm the president at the forefront, is trying very hard to meet these challenges. And the way we're doing it, and I say this here in Jerusalem, here at Binyan Omar, is actually to keep Israel and front and centre in everything that happens in Jewish life. Because we see that as the key. Sure, there are Orthodox people who remain Jewish no matter what happens. But, as we all know, that's a small percentage of our community. Israel, really, for us, is the connector. Uh, it's the provider of so many resources. It's the, it's the inspiration that really connects to the DNA of our community. So that's why we focus on Hebrew and Zionist education, formal and informal, trips to Israel, um, Hasbara support or public diplomacy, if you like, for our youngsters to uh, cope with anti-Israel propaganda on campus, and many, many other things which I won't go into, but they're all about trying to show the community, expose the community in a, to as many positive Israeli role models as possible, like our shlichim, our Israeli educators, madrachim, academics, personalities who we bring. The more we can create the Israeli atmosphere within our community, the better chance we have of doing well. Thank you very much.